Good evening, everyone. My name is Douglas Sprang, and I lead the Energy Environment Series for the MIT Club of Northern California. Tonight's event is the eighth in the series of all virtual events during our 2020 to 21 season, featuring top speakers in the field. Today's event features Bob Mungar, CEO of Commonwealth Fusion Systems, a company that was spawned out of a huge project at MIT's Department of Nuclear Science and Engineering, where the superconducting material technology that enabled this breakthrough was invented. Many of you may remember that five years ago, we featured Dennis White of MIT, who first described this technology and the potential it, it held for that. We have enabled live Q&A, and I'll do my best to get as many of these questions to our moderator as I can, although past experience suggests we won't get to all of them. We will also answer many of the questions we got from online registration. I'll be back at the end of the program to announce the speaker for our final event of the season, but now I would like to introduce Mark Platchon, a seasoned energy investor and major contributor to the club's energy and environment series who will orchestrate tonight's program. Take it away, Mark. Oh, <laughs> Mark, you're still on mute. Go oh, on mute. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome, Bob. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I am super, super excited to have the CEO of maybe one of the most important companies on the planet here to talk to us today. Not to put it in a grand frame, but it really is. Um, I've been in the Valley working on advanced technology and energy topics for almost 40 years. And the holy grail is to be able to get, you know, clean base load energy that that's plentiful and, and, and almost free. So this is the solution to that, um, I think. Um, we're going to go back and get Bob to talk about himself and how he got here. But I want to start with a little bit of a teaser um, so we can do a little physics and, and a little technology. Um, we all grew up knowing that fusion exists on the sun. And we all assumed all you got to do is make the sun conditions here on Earth and you can have fusion. And so I'm going to ask Bob to tell us what's the temperature on the sun. And if he just gets to that temperature, does he have fusion here? And of course, it's a trick question. So let's see what he says. Yeah, it's, it's, it's true that like you do have to get the conditions necessary for fusion to happen. But it's actually, uh, you can get fusion to happen pretty easily, like people do it in their garage. But to get fusion to happen at a rate that's vigorous enough with more power out than in that you actually care about, you have to do much, much, much better than the sun. So like people don't realize that the sun, it's really big, but its power density is like a compost pile. Uh, so it's fusing, but not very vigorous. And it's only about 20 million degrees, 30 million degrees, depending on where you are. And so to get to work on Earth, you actually have to beat the sun by many orders of magnitude. And uh, so on, on Earth, you would need to be practical, you know, somewhere in the 100 million degree um, range at um, the right combination of density and, and, uh, and insulation um, to get the power densities that, that would be something that you'd want to actually build. So 30 million degrees, not enough. You got to get... This is crazy. Yeah, and it's actually interesting that like, you know, everyone knows fusion happens really, really hot. And we have this like idea in our minds of like what hot means, right? And like well, there's a difference between 20 million and 100 million that means nothing to any of us, right? That is, that's not in our, our, our world. Um, and fusion is true that it's really, really hot, but it doesn't actually come with the same things that we associate with heat. It's like really, really hot, but you can blow it out with a breath, breath of air. It's like really, really hot, but it doesn't contain any real energy. It, it is hot, but not uh, enough of it, not enough heat capacity to matter. So people have an idea of like, oh, fusion must be like lava. It's so hot, it's, you know, it's a container of lava. It's, it's not, you're like building this container that holds this very fragile candle in the wind type situation, just in a really, really, really weird 
state of matter. So it's a pretty interesting physics problem. So <laughs> let's circle back. How did little kid Bob Mungard decide he wanted to solve this problem or meander into physics? Yes, it's a, um, you know, in fusion, it's it's a field that has, there's a lot of people that have, have gone through the fusion field. Like you, you'll find sort of um, fusion people that you know, have, or people that aren't in fusion now that have fusion somewhere in their background at graduate school or something like that. Uh, and you find people that are, are really diehard fusion people that have, have been that way since since really early. They knew this is what they want to work on. Um, so I actually, I more like, more sort of evolved into it. I, I actually came out of, um, uh, area of physics that was um, solid state physics, how to how to make faster hard drives. And um, and that field sort of had an inflection point uh, and I decided I'd go, I was working in a, a physics lab and I'd get a, get a PhD in something, um, not that. <laughs> and I ended up uh, thinking really hard about what I'd like to do. And I decided, well, I'd like to do something that I could talk about at a, uh, a cocktail party which solute, soluton physics is not really one of those things. Um, and it could matter in the world. And so I ended up at MIT um, in uh, the fusion program um, because at that time I was also getting very, very concerned about uh, climate. And that was something like 13, 14 years ago. And, uh, and once I got into it, you know, I saw uh, you know, how, how interesting the science was and how interesting the physics was and how impactful the applications could be. And it was only much later that we realized that we could um, try to accelerate it by, by turning it into um, the company that became CFS. So, so since we've got a pretty broad cross-section of people in the audience, not all physicists, and not all physicists know this arcane corner of the world, um, maybe we, we, we do the, the, the simple version of what is fusion and why is it not fission? Ah, yeah. So yeah, I'll, I'll throw a slide up. Um, so, <clears throat> so fusion is the exact opposite of fission in almost every physical way. So it's a nuclear reaction, but it's actually a nuclear reaction that takes the lightest elements and combines them together and makes something that's heavier. And in the process, some uh, bit of inner, some bit of mass is lost, turned into energy equals mc squared and so the the resulting products are are born with very very high energy that you can then use to you know heat something up basically so it's the literally it's the opposite end of the periodic table from fission fission is splitting fusion is combining in both cases though you're making something that you know every reaction that happens is something like 200 million times more energy per reaction than burning something so that's you know why you know fission works and why you don't have to have all this uranium going through a fission plant but it's also why the stars are billions of years old it was like you know before we knew what what fusion was we actually knew that something like it must happen because otherwise the universe did not make sense <laughs> that there's no way the stars could be as powerful as they were and as old as they were um and so what you're trying to do in a fusion plant on Earth is you're trying to build a machine that can make the conditions necessary, that's similar to stars, um, to create that reaction. And you know the machines, there's all sorts of different topologies that come in, you know, it's it's a fun little collage to make all the different ways people have tried to do this. But this this machine here is a tokamak, which is the most studied. And basically at the inside of this, you have a machine where you have a tiny, tiny bit of fusion fuel. So isotopes of hydrogen. Um, and that um, fuel, it's like subgram, that is heated to be very, very, very hot, 100 million degrees, and fusion reactions start to happen. And those reactions then heat up the surrounding materials, it, the normal materials that surround the machine, just like a flame in a coal plant heats up the boiler pipes in a coal plant, um, except instead of being heated by burning carbon, it's heated by fusing hydrogen isotopes. And that heat then can be um, you know, cooled, taken out, and turned into useful work, whether that is putting it into industrial process or you know, just boiling water to get steam to run a turbine to make electricity. Um, you're left with a, a source here of industrial heat. And 
if you can um, make it so that this plasma is insulated well enough so that it doesn't leak its heat out and get cool off at a rate faster than the heat it produces, um, something no one's ever done before. Um, if you could do that to work, you'd have basically a power amplifier. And that power amplifier um, could have very high gain. And you then have a machine that effectively doesn't really use any fuel. The amount of fuel that you would use for a whole decade lifetime of this machine you know, shows up day one in a truck. Um, you have a machine that on the outside of it is a dispatchable source of high quality heat. And, and that is, you know, the, has been the bedrock of uh, the energy infrastructure, you know, literally since James Watt. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's why it's very attractive. What and so, so where's this word tokamak come from? <laughs> yeah, so um, a to tokamak is actually, it's a Russian sort of quasi acronym. Um, it's a, a toroidal, so like a donut, which is, goes back to how they work and some basic plasma physics. Um, it's a donut that um, contains the plasma, the vacuum, plasma, and donut. And, man and magnets, it's got magnets. It's a great word. Too bad the Russians grabbed it for this. Yeah, yeah, it was a big deal when they invented tokamaks. It was like one of these big moments in the field. Uh, so and, uh, so really people have been building tokamaks. Um, I mean, you have a nice little picture of one. How big are they? Why are they so expensive? And why don't they work? Uh, yeah, it's good. There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, okay. So I, I said you have to get the right conditions. And um, what those, you can actually break that down for fusion. Um, you can break the fusion conditions down on a plot like this. There's, there's a really simple figure of merit. And we've known that since 1955. So like fusion is one of these fields that you know, there's not arguments about what is the, the figure of merit from a science standpoint. You have to get up to the point where you make more power than N, that we call that Q. In order to get there, you need to get something very, very hot. This is in physicist units here, but this is about 100 million degrees on this, this scale. Um, so I mentioned, you, had, you know, the sun is actually down here. Um, you know, most fusion machines are up here. Um, and then you also have to get um, it's not just enough to get it hot. You can get stuff very, very hot all sorts of different ways. You have to prevent that heat from leaking. You have to insulate it very well, um, which is confinement, and get enough of it together, which is density. And so if you have these three things, temperature, confinement, and density, I uh, call that the triple product, um, you can get up to a plasma that makes more power than it takes to run um, uh, from a plasma physics standpoint. And so people have tried lots and lots of different ways to do this. And the, the round dots here are actually tokamaks, are these machines that have been built um, uh, since the late 60s uh, around the world. We've built like 150 of them. And we've systematically you know, de-risked, under, understood the plasma physics that's inside these machines and have, have increased the performance of those machines. Um, uh, up to the point where the, the highest performing the machines in the world are, you know, Q above 0.1 but below one. Um, which and means, which means they still generate an order of magnitude less energy than you feed them. Right. Um, and if you think about like what that means, it's like, well, these machines are still generating from fusion. They're still generating like 10 million watts. So, you know, that's, that's big heat, a million, a megawatt is, you know, we don't, in our daily lives, we don't ever touch anything that's a megawatt. That's uh, more than your car, that's more than, uh, you know, it's orders of magnitude more than your house consumes. So these machines are making tens of millions of watts of fusion, but they're taking, you know, another factor of a few million watt, another factor of a few of those watts to just heat them. Uh, so like they're a losing battle, right? Um, you know, that's not, that's not something that you, you build to, to power anything. That's something you build to consume power. And the output of that is, is science and, and papers and understanding um, on the path to get there. And like this, this plot here is actually missing the element of time. If you take this plot and you put it on time and you plot the, you know, you can sort of picture like plotting the um, product of these two axes 
triple product. If you plot that parameter versus time, fusion actually beats Moore's law. Um, so we've you know systematically gone many many orders of magnitude up, and we're sitting a factor of a few away. And you know that's a testament to the scientific endeavor. Uh, and big science and, and you know, a lot of people that worked on that. I mean, think about what this is, you know, this is a, a plot here, or as a Manitou, this is like going from like flying a kite to like the Mach number of the shuttle. Like, you know, this is big, big regime changes across this plot, um, which is, you know, very exciting that people have been able to do that. And, and furthermore, not just do it, not just like demonstrate it, but actually understand it, actually measure it, repeat it, um, compare those measurements against simulations that you know the input is Maxwell's equations and Newton's laws and the simulations agree with the, the measurements within you know factors of 10 percent um, that's that's a real mountain of work that has been done uh, in this field so so you didn't cover why I mean why are they so big and so stupidly expensive <laughs> yeah so this this plot actually hides, a, um, a hidden variable, which is like, okay, so like we got close. Um, why aren't we crossed it? <laughs> why, why did we stop, right? Did we, did we like learn something fundamental in science that like that, that we hit a showstopper or, or what? And, and the reality is that we, we stagnated and we stagnated because, um, you know, at, at their heart, these, these tokamaks are big magnetic bottles and they're, they're insulating the plasma inside that magnetic bottle. So they're, they're big magnets. And um, if you think about like how to insulate something, like you wanna insulate your house, for instance, right? You really have a few options. Um, you can make the insulation better, like literally like you break up the little eddies of, of air by putting in foam or aerogel or something like that. So that makes the insulation better in the same space requires a technical change to do that. Or you could just make the wall thicker. And like, that's like the castle approach, right? You just make the walls thick enough and eventually you get good insulation. And it turns out that the magnetic field has this big impact in how these machines work. And you can, you can look at the, the history of building all those machines and the, the theory and simulation and wind tunnels and all the stuff that's inside them. And you can see how much their performance how well insulated they are is measured by the, the gain as a function of size and field. And there's this very steep dependence. And so you'd love to just, you know, march anywhere you want on this plot to get to high gain. But we actually had a limit that from a technology standpoint, you could not build an arbitrarily strong magnet and and still have a superconducting magnet, which you need these magnets to be superconducting, otherwise they're giant toaster ovens. Um, and that was about six you Tesla. Need to go explain that. Why do they need to be superconducting? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a subtlety, isn't it? It's like okay, you're building a, a big magnet to hold a plasma in. Well, if the magnet is made out of copper. Well, you have to run a current through that magnet continuously to make the magnet work. Yeah. And if you run that current through there, you can do a quick calculation and realize that you need an entire power plant just to run the current in the magnet and you'll never make up for it. And so if you have a superconductor, you can run that current in the magnet without losing any power and you can actually you know, run the whole thing, the whole magnet and uh, without dissipating any, any heat. Uh, and all you have to do is keep it cold. So uh, now we went from something that's supposed to be at 100 million degrees, but it has to also be Super cooled. Uh, yeah, that's right. And, and in fact, the um, the outdoor C mod um, tokamak, which is the tokamak at MIT that um, has been uh, disassembled now, um, it it's, holds a whole bunch of records for fusion stuff. But it actually has a real a unique record, and that it is within it. It goes from uh, about uh, fifty million degrees to um, liquid nitrogen temperature, which is um, uh, in the magnet over space like this big. And at the edge of the plasma, actually, it goes from a million degrees to room temperature in about two millimeters. And that holds the record for the, the, uh, the largest thermal gradient in the solar system. And uh, that's how well insulated these things are. If you think about like insulation as a thermal gradient. Carnot would have loved that delta T. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but if you, if you go back to, you know, you have to have a supernova magnet to make a power reactor. Um, 
well, if the magnet technology can't go, you know, right of six Tesla here, that means your only option is either to figure out some new physics, some some undiscovered reason to make tokamaks perform better pound for pound by moving these curves up and down by nature, hoping to discover something, which is a great scientific endeavor, but not something that's that reliable to, to bank on. Or you just uh, you know go to the highest field you can go, solve for the size it needs to be, and go build that. And uh, and that is exactly what um, actually this machine called Eater um, that's being built in the, the south of France, which is a, a big international collaboration and the largest construction project in Europe. It's exactly what it is. It's the the smallest tokamak that you could build with what we understand today in plasma physics that would make more power out than in, like ten times more. Um, with the technology of the magnet that existed when we started to build it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so you can't fault anyone for that. Like, that's exactly what you needed to do in order to, um, to break through this barrier here. And um, how big is lighter? Yeah, so it's big. Um, here's, a, here's a picture of it. Um, here's a, uh, a person down here. Um, uh, so this is, you know, this is office building big. This weighs as much as a battleship. Um, and it's, it's being built as a, a plant here. You know, it's on a big, big acreage um, uh, that is the, about a, people debate how much it costs. It's, it's almost, it's actually getting pretty far along construction. It's, I think right now it's about 70% complete. Um, but uh, it's, it's tens of billions of dollars. Uh, but the, the scientific community is, is convinced this this will work. You build this, this will work. Um, as know, a research react, as a research machine, or as a power plant? Yeah, as as a you know as a research machine that makes five hundred megawatts of of thermal power um, for uh, hour level time at a time um, at uh, gains of ten. That's that's the goal of it. And and you know there's been blue ribbon panel after blue ribbon panel that have reviewed this. Um, you know, keeps going over budget, so means that you know gets reviewed a lot, uh, and they all come um, out and say, yeah, like you know, the science here is sound, the technology is sound, the project delivery is it's a giant mega project, doing the best they can, as sort of the attitude, and uh, finish it and turn it on, it's likely to work. So the problem's been solved. All they got to do is miniaturize it and lower the cost. Well. There's other things that it has to do besides just make more power than in. So we can't gloss over that. Um, we have to do infusion. But you know, a primary barrier here is, you know, if you have to organize all the industrialized nature, nations of the world together in order to to make a step forward, you know, it sort of really begs the question of are you ever going to make that commercial? And here at the same time, you know, we're in a situation globally where energy is a market and we need to scale technology very, very quickly. Those are both things that are very commercial minded. Um, and at the same time, we have this massive pull of how are we going to, to combat climate change and looking through the technology approaches we have in front of us, we've got a lot of really good ones that can get us um, you know, a lot of the way there, but there's some really, really tough, tough things to fight in climate change where having a, a new, new type of energy source would be very helpful. So go ahead and you know, you, you kind of teased us with the problem of the copper magnets needing to be superconductors. Yeah. You can move that curve, tell us how. Right, so um, we, we know that these curves bend down, that we know the shape of these curves. And I, I, sh I mentioned Alcatraz C mod. Um, so uh, these are Alcatraz C and C mod, which are our cousins at MIT. And we built these machines and here's, Here's one of them, C mod here, um, and you know this is human scale. This is not office block scale, and this this machine um, is the highest field machine in the world right now, and is the record holder for um, uh, the temperature times density. So I, I said you needed three things. So this machine can get to the right temperatures, can get to the right densities, and can holds the record for the pair. And its sister machine actually holds the record for the time, the, the, how well it's confined, and the density, and got the, the right um, uh, uh, confinement. So like we know that, that those curves are out there. We know how they work. Um, 
But this machine, in order to build this and operate it, we didn't have the superconducting magnet. And so it's a copper machine. And this thing takes you know an entire power plant to run this little, little thing. And it can only be on for a few seconds at a time. Otherwise, the magnet gets too hot. Um, so uh, proof of principle, but, but not commercial. And, and that was great for science, but not really on the path to power plant. But then something happened. It was, it was talked about by Doug in the beginning. So something happened um, in material science completely unrelated to fusion. Uh, and that was they discovered and, and really brought up to scale, well, sort of small scale, um, a new superconductor. Um, and the superconductors, they naturally, from sort of quantum mechanical um, effects and limits, they they only operate in certain regimes. They have to be very cold, and people sort of associate, um, you know, very cold with superconductivity if they know anything about it. But also, they have to be below a certain magnetic field; otherwise, they stop conducting. And hence, that's why you can't build arbitrarily strong superconducting magnets. And that has all these knock-ons and like how to build MRI machines or how to build large hadron collider or all sorts of things. But this material that people found was so different than all the materials that happened before. And like every way you can imagine it was different. Um, and in a key way, it didn't really care at all about the magnetic field. And so you, you've removed a material science constraint from the problem. You've added a whole bunch of other weird stuff like the fact that this material is um, a thin film. It's like a VCR tape. It's not what you're used to making magnets out of. Um, but it's also operates at a different temperature. It's made out of different stuff, different material properties, uh, uh, all sorts of things. But we realized that you could, if you could make this into a magnet, which we've now now done. Um, five years ago, it was like, whoa, what if we did this? And Dennis and I are working on this. And now it's like, okay, like make this into a magnet. Um, if you could make this into a magnet, you could eliminate um, this constraint, and you could build arbitrarily strong magnets and you could build much smaller tokamaks um, without having to change the fundamental physics that we've worked so hard to, to de-risk, to understand. Um, and so that's a different flavor of an approach to fusion than we'd had before. Like previously we had approaches that were like, well, bang away on tokamaks but make them bigger or go do something completely different that you know doesn't look anything like a tokamak and hope the plasma physics works out, or you can discover your way to, to better and better performance. And this offered a, a different trajectory, which is eliminate this constraint that made tokamak so big by building this new type of magnet. And, and that's, that's really the fundamental you know, premise the company was built on uh, and what we do today. And, and you know, it's been a, a very fun journey of the last three years in, in both building those magnets and also developing the, um, uh, the, the company around them and, and trying to, to work as fast as possible towards climate. So there, I mean, there's lots of inventions at universities that stay in the university for a long time until it's, you know, solved and, and figured out. You haven't yet built this proof of principle machine. Um, tell us the story of of how, why, wherefore this ended up getting put together as a integrated unit and pushed out or jumped out of the university. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I guess the corollary to that is lots of people on this call have tried to go out and raise money with a PowerPoint slide deck and found it's very hard. <laughs> yeah. You've basically got a slide deck with some proof points, but you've been able to put together the leaping off money. Yeah, and you know, so the a story, if you, if you actually run it back uh, in time, we, we had um, this, uh, this man of technology. We have a really, really fantastic team. So we built this team um, in the Department of Energy funded program at MIT. It's the largest team at MIT, largest single experiment at MIT. Um, and, uh, and meanwhile, like you have the pull of, of climate and the sort of resurgence of clean tech investing in sort of 2014, 15 timeframe. 
And you have this technology come along that's like a really, you know, concrete path on how to build um, a next generation token map. <clears throat> and, you know, we were able to see, see that landscape. You know, part of it was we were forced to see that landscape. The Department of Energy had cut the funding of the machine. So we had to figure out what we want to do next. So we had, you know, lots of, lots of late nights of with the whole team there figuring out like, you know, what if we built this type of science experiment or did this, you know, could we get the Department of Energy to fund a Stellarator and another type of bottle. Um, and we came to the conclusion that no, like the reason we were all there is because we actually wanted to impact energy. Like we got into this to build energy and, and put light bulbs, turn light bulbs on. And that we weren't really in the federal program on a path to do that. Um, uh, we were on a different path, a path that was great on science, but not, you know, despite the name Department of Energy, not going to produce energy in this particular field. Um, and uh, so I said, well, what's what's the other ways to do this? And you know, Boston, MIT, you know, we got a lot of people around us that uh, had built great energy companies, battery companies. Um, materials companies, uh, all sorts of, of things. And so, you know, they started to they would come hang out and be like, you know, we could do this. We could turn this into a company, but in order to, for it to work, like, you'd have to realize it would be a bit weird. Like, you know, the first thing you would do is you build a, a big machine that you're basically like in the same realm of, you know, big science. How, how would you go about structuring that? It's like, and also like, man, you, you don't want to go from the biggest project at MIT to three guys in a garage. That's, that's not a recipe for progress in this field. You need to figure out how to, to bootstrap in it, off of what's already been done at the labs, national labs and MIT. Um, and so we had to think really hard about it. And fortunately we had, we had people around us who were longtime energy investors um, who could give really good advice and eventually said, look, we, would, we, want, to, we want to fund this. Um, we think this is a really good idea. Let's take the time and figure out how to structure it to set it up for maximum success. Um, and so that's everything from the people who became Breakthrough Energy Ventures, which is um, uh, Gates's um, energy investment arm, to um, Vinod Kosla, who's a big supporter, to big oil and gas companies. Um, and we got a sort of got a, a critical mass. We had some philanthropy and things to get it going. Got a critical mass that said, "Look, there's a there there," and um, we were able to then, you know, structure it so that it instead of you know sort of spinning out small company out at MIT, we could become a company and partner back with MIT um, and continue the line of research that had been so well seeded. Um, but now, you know, explicitly with the idea of how to pull it out over time. So, you know, it's not throwing it over the fence. It's not keeping it in. It's, it's sort of a big venture creation arc. Um, and that took a you know, ton of, of work and negotiation. A number of lawyers is I don't even think about, but um, you know that that led to where we are now, which is you know actually CFS, the company, which is a startup, is the largest single private um, uh, funder of research and energy at MIT. Um, you know we actually fund more research at MIT as CFS than um, the big oil major. Uh, they do it individually, uh, and and we've been able to build a a really really interesting collaborative team. So the total team now is about 280 people. And about 160 of them are CFS employees that come from, you know, Tesla and SpaceX and and you know big banks and energy utilities that would never really be in the academic environment, but have all the tools to pull to pull things out in the market. And then of course the other side is people that you know are professors and grad students that are in uh, in the field. Um, you know we're at the major conferences for this field. Um, deeply plugged in. And so we've been able to, to structure that. And, and that, you know, that was really, really key to, to really getting people to buy in at a level of wanting to put their money behind it. Um, you know, great team, great, good idea, you know, technical risk retirement that can pass due diligence, uh, different approach, um, structured in a way to be long-term success. Uh, and that took years to do, but <laughs> so I, 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 I you know, I sympathize with anyone who's been out trying for a long time to get something launched because this took about four or five years. So, so let me go back and put you on the spot on one point here. You've got, you know, this ambitious project that people are now willing to fund. And it's maybe the world's most complicated 
project that has to figure out, I mean, the technology, the physics, the manufacturing, the scaling, the how do you eventually get into displacing coal at utilities, you'd think that the backers would bring in some giant corporate manager that's run a giant company. Why you? <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I, I can tell you, I, it's not from experience. <laughs> I've never mm -hmm. built a company like this before. Um, but, uh, you know, we actually, we had enough time to, to gestate that it became, um, you know, clear that, uh, that A, you needed to have someone technical um, to get this thing, you know, off the ground. This, you know, this is a pretty complicated technology and, you know, the still has more technology yet to go. So you don't want to just parachute someone in that doesn't understand that. Um, there's also like, you know, there's not a lot of ways that you can misstep here on the science. And so you want to be plugged into, continue to be plugged into the scientific environment and scientific community. And we are, we actually, we open our, the like eight of the top 10 red physics papers, plasma physics papers last year um, were published by us um, with significant CFS co-authors, all with, there's like 11 different institutions that are on those papers you know, where we publish the science, like this is what we plan to do, this is what we're designing to. But then we, you know, develop the engineering, we, we you know, do the project execution as a, a private thing. Um, so you needed to be able to interface with all that. And, um, and I, you know, was the one that, that sort of got tapped really early to pull this thing together and grew a lot during that process. And, you know, as um, the investors got to know me and said, okay, like, you know, we, we buy that this is doable. And, now there was enough uh, institutional checks around uh, in terms of checks and balances to, to be able to, to do it. And then we've proven, you know, really proven ourselves over the last three years. Um, you know, three years ago, we came out and said we were gonna do a certain set of things. And, and you know, a lot of people said, that's pretty crazy. Um, it's gonna take you 20 years. And, you know, we're, we're just about a month away from hitting the, the um, timeline that we said uh, next month. And we'll have done um, exactly what we said we were gonna do uh, and more. Um, so, so, so you were talking about checks um, when you were spinning out and you got breakthrough and others to back you. Give us the trajectory of money that you raised and and you know how many gazillion dollars does it take to get the gazillion degrees of heat. <laughs> yeah, so so you know the the Series A, which was the first money in the company, was 115 million dollars. Um, so it was a big series A. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty big series A. Um, speed round from hell. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, we had a long time to raise it. Um, uh, and the, um, since then, we've raised about another 100 and we're about, we raised about 250 total. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we turned that into a whole bunch of, of technologies and, and, um, and progress, which we're very proud of. So you, you mentioned there's a, a big milestone coming up. Maybe you can kind of outline the big arc of, of de-risking and what you build when, and, and you know, when, when do you get to a real commercial solution? Yeah, so um, sorry, this is kind of blurry here, but this is, this is Eater, um, and then this is Spark to scale, which Spark is the next machine that we're, we're just getting started to, to build. And it has on those curves, it's on the same curve as Eater, it's the same plasma physics. It's uh, actually, we, we say it's um, Q greater than one, but it's more like Q greater than 10. And if you run all the, the simulations and, and tools that are used to design a machine like Eater, you get the um, same answer uh, out of Spark. And that's not, not surprising. People have had the idea to, to build really high field tokamaks before, but it really relied on building a magnet out of this new material that could go to very high field, go to 20 Tesla, which is um, very high. And so, you know, what we've done over the last um, last couple of years is we've developed that magnet technology. Um, everything from the supply chain of the material, where we had to scale the supply chain of the material by an order of magnitude, um, uh, to the fabrication techniques that we had to invent to make a magnet out of what's effectively VCR tape. Um, to the ability to, to put it all together and have it withstand the stresses and temperatures and, and everything like that. And uh, so here's, here's actually the magnet with, with people, um, the team in the middle of assembling it here. Um, and so this, this 
magnet is now um, assembled and it's it's getting inserted into its test stand that recreates the conditions inside the tokamak in terms of temperatures and vacuum and all, and all that. And uh, and it'll be tested here in, in June. And in fact, it's made out of um, 16 layers. Right, so here's here's Rui, who's a great MIT engineer assembling um, some of the layers. And each one of these layers of the six, 16 of them, each one of them is by at least an order of magnitude the largest magnet in the world made out of this material. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the whole magnet itself has about 300 kilometers of this material in it. Um, when people had, before were making it out of hundreds of meters. Um, and 100 kilometers of film. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, we've, we've purchased something like, we have a whole bunch of, we have a you know, very elaborate supplier and, and R&D into the supply chain that we work with the people that, that make the material and develop it. Um, and we're, we, we own something like the majority of the material that's ever been produced. Uh, I think now it's, yeah, way more than the majority. Um, and, uh, and so we've been able to, to develop this man technology with the goal of going to the conditions that you need to build a really high field tokamak. Um, and that's, uh, uh, you know, was a big team effort and something you couldn't do if you just started from scratch. You needed places that had, you know, big cranes and expertise um, and cryogenics and the, the things to support this. And we were able to, through, you know, relationship with MIT, um, make sure that that all that infrastructure and all that expertise wasn't lost. Instead, it was, it was, you know, used to launch the next, next wave of, of this um, technology, and uh, and you know it's been very exciting to do. So this summer, you proved that this one magnet makes magnetism the way you want. Then, how many of these do you need to build to to make spark? Uh, Eighteen of them. And when does that get sort of? Yeah. So together? we've actually already um, already started that. So. Um, the, you know, this, I mentioned before that, you know, the teams are people that are, you know, classic researchers, but also industrial people. Um, and so this magnet was not just, it was not hand built. Um, it was, you know, pieces were hand assembled here, but, you know, it was built on automated machinery. It was custom made and developed for the process with the eye of not just how do you make 18 of these magnets, but how do you make these magnets in a way that you can make, you know, somewhere on the order of, you know, a hundred thousand of them a year someday. Right, like the from the beginning, the whole thing is built that look, you know, th this cannot be a scientific curiosity. This has got to be towards an energy source, and it needs to be an energy source. You got to be able to manufacture it. Um, and so it was all built on on machines that the team developed, and those machines now are actually transitioning to their next their next um, next job um, improvements being made. Um, where we, you know, we went actually on those machines from the first man, the first of these layers taking us like six weeks to make, <laughs> to being, you know, four days. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we're planning to get even significantly less than that. Um, but uh, that next, that next setup is actually going up in our, our new site in um, outside of Boston, uh, a place called Devon's. Um, we have a 47 acre campus and and one of the buildings that is being built right now at that, that site is a um, factory that will house this machinery that was developed to make this magnet um, to make the 18 that are going to be needed for Spark, but then also to start making the ones that are going to be needed for the, the next machine and the machine after that. So you're making giga magnet factories. Uh, you know, if you run the numbers, it's actually really interesting. That like if you, if you just take something like the giga factory, and uh, which, you know, we got people that worked at the Giga factory and helped design it. And you think about the, the processes that happen there. If you made superconductor at the scale that you make batteries in a Giga factory in terms of the amount of deposition, yep. um, you can make enough superconductor to feed a fusion industry that can make somewhere on the order of thousands of fusion power plants a year. And if you made thousands of fusion power plants a year, you would have the fastest growth rate of, uh, uh, energy in human history. Um, and so that's one of the great things about fusion is like, if you can make it work and if you can make it work so it's manufacturable, you're not talking about building like EVs or solar panels. Like you're talking about building like airplanes 
They're more complicated, but there's many, 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 many fewer of them. And the mass throughput of the factory that you need and the, the sort of footprint of the whole thing is just much, 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 much smaller. Um, and it goes back to the idea like, you know, fusion at its core is not about a resource. It's not about like capturing a resource, whether, you know, digging it up or waiting for it to come by um, in the wind or, or, or sun that's diffuse. It's, it's not about that. It's about, you know, a technology. If you, if you know how to build this, you have energy, full stop. Like, you know, no other precondition of like, is the sun shining today? Or did you happen to be on the right piece of land? Um, and and that, that manufacturability we think is, is, you know, obviously it's big, that's a long time out, but you know, we've built the whole endeavor from the beginning to be able to, to get there in the, in the long term. When, when you say you're gonna build, you know, there's a certain size machine you need to make this thing work. Um, put it in energy terms. Is it is one machine replace a coal plant or a nuclear plant, or does it yeah. take five or ten of them, or what? Um, yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, so I think if you you know here's all the power plants in the world. So there's there's sort of sixty ish thousand power plants in the world. And you know, a lot of these are um, big plants that that are um, fossil fuel plants. Um, but if you if you break it all down, you know, somewhere um, uh, around a 200 megawatts is how we get most of our our electricity today. Um, uh, you know, there's there's some things that are multi gigawatt big nuclear reactors. There's you know, solar residential solar that's much smaller. But when we talk about grid scale, it's usually ten. Uh, hundreds of megawatts. And that turns out to be the size of power plant that you can get with this technology. Um, and so it means that you can get a power plant, which I, I showed earlier. Um, the um, yeah, like a power plant like this, which is about a 200 megawatt electric power plant. Um, and that fits very well into the existing infrastructure. Um, uh, so it's not the size that you're going to use power your house. It's not the size you can power car. Um, but it's also not the size that you're going to build a giant mega project for. It's sort of a small gas turbine. Um, and here's actually compared, you talk about manufacturing. So this is actually compared to, um, this is the Helioid um, uh, 10, which is the largest offshore wind turbine, just the nacelle top of it. And so this is a 12 megawatt electric system. Um, and so, you know, this is manufactured in, in France um, and then it sits on top of an Eiffel Tower. Um, and so that's that's what you're talking about when you talk about like oh okay, fusion you know what's the power density here, what's the you know what's the attractiveness from a just economic point of view that if you can build it this small, um, you know and you can manufacture it you should be able to 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 get to to low low costs and you add up all the build materials and add up what it costs to manufacture things and and you do that does pencil out. The pencils out to be a viable way to scrape away the coal plant and and use this as the heat source. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Uh, it, but that means you have to get it all to work, right? So like, you know, people that, that dive in and, and, and look at it is like, okay, like, yeah, okay, you can make these things manufacturable, you can make them at a cost that makes some sense with the assumptions you put in around what all goes into them. And the, the manufacturing we've done so far to, to how to make them and um, we have a long track record of building them. Um, but you know, can you actually Get one to, to work first can you get one to make more power than in for the plasma which like people have a mental block on like can that even happen physically of course it can the sun works but like there's still a, a you know we haven't done it on earth and then you know can you do that you know repeatedly and can you do that at reliabilities and availabilities that matter you know how long does the machine break take before it breaks down you know those are the, the types of questions that are still out there um but you know we we diligently work on. So what are you telling your investors on timeline? Yeah, so, you know, our, our timeline has, has been the same since the beginning, which is uh, we started this in 2018, we said three years and we build a, uh, a super connecting magnet. In fact, I think I have a, a timeline. Yeah, here we go. Um, three years, full scale super connecting magnet. Um, then uh, uh, 2025, build Spark, net energy, push a button and make 100, 100 megawatt scale fusion power um, at gains of above one, you know, closer to 10. Um, 
And then that sets up the next machine, which would be the first commercial machine to hook to the grid and, and produce electricity. And, you know, machine, uh, the economics of that machine, you know, are going to be a bit, a bit more shaky than, uh, you know, you want to be at nth of a kind, but it will be in the right ballpark. And, and that machine we think is the early 2030s. So I mean, we set out, we said, okay, like this is, a, this is not a seven year problem. You know, client, you're not gonna solve climate on a couple year bet. You're, you're gonna make an impact in these types of markets by building new industries. And in this case, you know, it's a 15 year horizon. We're now three years into that and so far so good. Um, and uh, it also means that you have to be really careful with the type of investors you take and, and how you structure things. So um, let's let's cover one other topic. I mean, as soon as people talk about these kinds of exotic energy sources, talk about safety. I mean, you know, the I was on nuclear submarines. I worked for Admiral Rickover, as you know. Um, but commercial fission is dead in the United States. Um, why is this so different in every way? From a safety and regulatory perspective. So um, yeah, it's great. It's good. Good point. And this is you know all new energy technologies, all, all new technologies. You know, face the a uh, hurdle. Like, can you? What's the social license around them, and, and why is that the case? And uh, so in, in fusion, I think the first thing you got to get your head around is uh, so you know it is a um, you know rearranging the nuclei, um, but it's not the same reaction as fission in, in many really important ways. First, uh, it's not a chain reaction. So there's no, there's no knock on, there's no exponentiation. There's, not, there's no idea of criticality. There's, there's no runaway. Um, and uh, you know, that, that's really important. You send the thing off, it stops. <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally. Like you, 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 I mean, you shut it down by, we literally inject a tiny bit of gas into it to, of, of just air. To shut it down, um, and the you know there's actually no no like real concept of like control rods or anything like that um, because it doesn't, have, it doesn't have chain reaction. Just like you know your automobile doesn't have a chain reaction. Um, the uh, other thing is you know after the reaction happens, the output the waste is helium, which is very different than the waste of splitting uranium which at the output of the splitting, you get transuranics. You get these daughters that continue to split, that are biologically active, that, that um, are, are radioactive of all sorts of different types of half-lives and types of, of products. You don't have any of that. Fusion, the end result of fusion is a helium atom that's the most stable thing in the world. Um, if you believe it or not. You do make neutrons though, so you have to like think about what to do about the neutrons. The neutrons hit materials, they, they activate those materials, but that's a completely different type of, of um, materials problem than nuclear waste. Um, you know, activated materials, you get to choose what the materials are that you put there, you have to choose how often you replace them. They're not pr producing transuranics, they're not producing things that last a really long time, um, and uh, they're not participating in, they're just along for the ride, they're not part of the reaction. So there's a whole lot of things from the fundamentals that are yeah, those um, those neutrons don't mess up your magnet. So you have to watch for that. Um, so you have to put enough stuff between the production of the neutrons in the plasma and the magnet in order to absorb um, those neutrons enough of them. Um, and it helps if the magnet is a bit more tolerant of neutrons um, than the superconductor is. And and so in our case, you know this both those things turn out to be um, true. You can put enough material in, and that's not something that is like a you know, genius thing to do. It's like, yeah, we put enough material, we put nuclear reactors inside concrete, right? <laughs> you put material in, you stop neutrons. Um, uh, and you can do that actually. And that's actually sets the minimum size of these machines. And this distance right here, you know, it's a donut. So you gotta fit the stuff down the middle of the donut. And uh, this, this is enough to stop the neutrons. Um, yeah. Uh, that's how you do it. So we had a bunch of questions about how how small can you make, can you run a ship or a, a, a truck or a train on this stuff? Yeah, so you fusion itself, you know, because of the uh, <coughs> sort of the, the nature of plasma physics, 
it's really difficult to ever picture a fusion in like your automobile. You could, there are some fusion concepts that if they, all the plasma physics works out and they're, they're very early um, R and D stages. Um, oh, the plasma physics works out, like maybe you could power ship. Um, uh, Tokamaks, yeah, this took, we we did the math one. So this, this, this would be pretty big. This is like aircraft carrier. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, like, you know, I think there's, you know, I'm, I'm a nuclear engineer um, uh, by background. And uh, I think there's some really good opportunities uh, things that we should be using fission for lots of things. And certainly um, uh, there are some interesting small ones for there that you can get much smaller than you can get in a fusion system. Right. So so now you're the CEO of the most important company on the planet. I would say other that. Than, other than curing cancer, you're gonna cure energy here. Um, how do you, you know, and you're a first time CEO, who are your, who are your role models? Who are you learning from? What projects? Have you looked at as your role models for how you get there? Well, uh, first I want to push back against curing, curing uh, energy. That's, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to, we're hoping to be a piece of it. Uh, that's such a big problem that like, you know, it's going to take everybody. And I don't think there's going to be a single cure. That's going to be a, a cocktail. And we hope to be a part of that. Um, and, uh, uh, and hopefully it becomes a really important company, but right now, you know, it's a, it's an enterprise that's that's venture backed out there pushing pushing against uh, the future uh, and trying to uh, manage risk effectively, right? And so when I when I think about how how that goes, you know, I, I think oftentimes I'm a big history of technology person um, behind this Zoom background is bookshelves of history of technology um, and. Uh, the, you know, we've done a lot of crazy things in technology in the past and, and people, I think maybe we forget that, um, especially in venture um, that, uh, you know, we can think of associate venture with only software when reality is like, you know, you mentioned Rickover, like Admiral Rickover, you know, with a team of about six people basically laid the entire foundation for the nuclear power industry um, in a summer when they decided they would do it and they, what got people together? So okay, how do you put a nuclear power plant inside a submarine? It has to be done yesterday. Um, and they went and they did it. And they didn't have the materials. They invented the materials as they went, um, and uh, did some you know very very clever in how they organized themselves, and ended up building nuclear power in the Navy. And then of course that became nuclear power around the world. Um, and so that's you know that's entrepreneurship by uh, just in a different organization than um, uh, say out in Silicon Valley. It's entrepreneurship, but working within the government. Um, and then I think, you know, there's other, you know, technologies that have made huge impacts in the world that, uh, you know, happen much, much quicker than people think they will. They sort of go from this impossible to inevitable um, uh, in one fell swoop. And it's like genetic engineering. You know, you go back to the beginning of biotech and you say like, look, you know, there was these crazy people that were real sort of hippies thinking about how to met, um, mess around with DNA inside of bacteria. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, what if we made those bacteria make insulin? And that is genotech. And that's the birth of biotech. Um, it happened way faster than you thought. Um, and so I, I think there's, there's a lot of examples out there where you know, the really hard edge science, things that can seem really complicated, um, it can seem, you know, uh, you know, governments have been working on it for so long, you know, those types of storylines they can they can actually flip um they can flip much faster than than we than even the people involved in it can think of i mean you go back and you look at human genome project people that were involved in the human genome project thought it was going to take decades and then shotgun sequencing happened with supercomputers and it took a year and they can get a, a genome for 100 bucks 23 and me right. so With, with this being so, so vital, so important, you know, such an important breakthrough, um, why shouldn't the government, and I'm sure you've dealt with this, why shouldn't the government sort of make this a Manhattan project level thing and put all the money, all the resources, national lab level horsepower and help you succeed? Well, you know, I think um, in, in some sense, you know, the days of like building a Manhattan project are, are, are sort of 
are sort of done. That's maybe not the most efficient way to do it. There's other, I think, really interesting models that, um, and in fact, um, I think the one that is is really int most interesting. It's actually been en enacted into law and is in the, the process of of being stood up in the government in the United States is um, what we did with uh, with the commercial space, where we had NASA and NASA, you know, had a a, a mission that was fundamentally around you know the um, discovery and exploration, but it was sort of you know hamstrung a bit by having to build rockets. <laughs> And maybe tripping over their own feet a little bit. And apologies to anyone uh, on the call that's that's a NASA folk. Um, but uh, and then, you know we said okay let's let's let different organizational styles try out doing this and let's try to transfer some of that knowledge into them and, and that you know that that became um, SpaceX and, and Orbital Sciences and like Virgin and the, those companies. But in that process, actually the government you know ran competitions and uh, and helped you know, defray costs of building rockets um, uh, by doing like a milestone-based reimbursement. You do what you say you're gonna do, we'll, we'll put up a bit of money, um, spend that money in the United States on, on people, on steel, and good, keep going. And then actually, so they, they actually about half funded SpaceX's um, first, uh, the Falcon 9 and the, uh, the Dragon. And that was, that was taxpayer reimbursed but it turns out that SpaceX very quickly um, returned all that capital and taxes um, many times over um, because they became an industry. And th so that model is out there and then that model has actually um, been enacted for fusion. Uh, and there's other, other pieces of the model too, which is you know, how do we get the national labs to not just be focused on, okay, let's build you know, big science experiments, but let's figure out how to take what we've learned and move it into this nascent industry. And we're not the only fusion company. Um, there's there's actually about 25 fusion companies. There's over two billion dollars invested in those companies, and there's you know they have an industry association, and there's actually more money invested in fusion companies than there are in small modular reactor companies. Um, and so you know how do we how do we push that along? How do we put the policies in place that can help that? How do we um, uh, both scientifically um, through uh, you know some levels of uh, R&D stimulus through, um, you know, actually the U.S. Uh, Department of Energy just completed National Sciences, uh, Academy of Sciences, which Dennis was on, completed a big study that said, look, it's time to go now, um, that we are ready to do um, a push in fusion, and that the US, U.S., if they don't move forward on building a net energy fusion machine of some sort, they're going to fall behind. They're already falling behind um, against uh, China and U.K. and European investments. So we, we think there's a big, the thing is turning. Do you have competitors sort of in China or Europe or elsewhere? Uh, so most of the fusion companies are, are based in, in the US. Um, uh, the, there are a few in Europe and, and certainly, you know, China, what is a energy uh, company and what is the government is, you know, a bit, uh, a bit nebulous sometimes, but they're very gung ho on, uh, on fusion. Um, and then have seen you know increased investments, uh, new projects. So it's it's a very it's a very exciting time to be in it. And you know I'd say it's still at the stage where everyone gets along pretty well and uh, cheers each other on. And uh, you know we've made different technical approaches, different different paths to get there. Uh, and you know we like ours, but we think some of the other ones are are um, are clever and and maybe they work out, maybe not. But you know how do we all get there for climate. So so if you're gonna make the, the core engine, if you're gonna make the heat engine for the future power plant, who are all the partners and what corporate alignments do you need in order to take this to the to, to importance? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to do anything, you know, uh, if you have to do it all yourself, it's it's not a very fast way to go. Um, the uh, you know, so basically, you know, what a fusion machine is is you know, there's a manufactured piece like a gas turbine is manufactured, but then there's you know the other stuff that goes with it, the switch gear and the um, turbines if it's electric and uh, heat exchangers, things like that. So it's it's a lot of the same people that are part of the energy ecosystem today, right? Same people that are out there um, permitting um, solar plants and and building. Um, uh, substations and same people that are, are figuring out what to do with 
the retiring coal plants or how to keep the nuclear plants running. Um, it's, it's that sort of industrial energy um, engineering scale. It's also, you know, for instance, we have at CFS two of our, our big um, uh, investors and strong supporters have been uh, ENI and Equinor, which is the Italian and Norwegian uh, super majors. And, you know, they, they very forward on fusion. They're very public. They think it's, they, they're very, very much like it. Um, and you think about why it's like, well, it's, you know, if you're a big energy company, like, you know, how to deliver projects. And these are the type of scale projects that you could see delivering. Um, you know, instead of delivering an offshore oil rig, like, could you deliver something like this? Um, and, you know, that's hundreds of thousands of people and supply chains that make pipes and, and things that sort of fit in this mold. So, you know, we, our, our mindset is like, can you build it as an ecosystem where you can pull people with you um, that, that have skills? Um, otherwise, you're not going to get there very fast. So Jennifer Granholm would ask you, does it create jobs? Well, you know, we, we're proudly creator of, uh, you know, over half the company we hired in the last year. Um, so <laughs> we're creating jobs <laughs> in that sense. So what, what, I mean, just so we can get this in our heads, it, and I know it's a few years out, but what do you think, that's actually some of the questions we're getting are, how much is the machine gonna cost? What's the LCOE of electricity realistically projected to be? You know, does this, is this gonna work against other base load players? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, you know, so we are, this is, this is the machine um, spark, which we are, we are actually, you know, it's designed and um, we are starting to build now. So we have the site, we have the permits, we have um, uh, construction starting and it's the, the smaller machine, <laughs> but it's about half scale. So we actually have a pretty good idea what this costs, um, you know, based on, not on conjecture, but based on engineering and, and quotes and, uh, suppliers are, are, are lined up and, uh, and also we have, you know, all these other token banks that have been built. And if you go off of this, which we think is a pretty firm place to go, then the power plant, um, which, you know, is bigger, has a couple more subsystems in there, but those are also subsystems that, that from a materials and manufacturing standpoint have been done, uh, in parallel. Um, uh, you know, we think this could be a, a levelized cost of electricity that could be one of the, the cheapest levelized cost of electricity. Um, and, you know, it's like, imagine, you know, if you built a, a, a gas plant, but you didn't have to have the gas or coal plant, you didn't have to have the coal. Um, that's the sort of scale of, of footprint that this could get to. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, that's less than five cents a kilowatt hour um, for a dispatchable um, uh, source of uh, zero carbon. That's, that's something that's very attractive to people especially in a world that you need to deeply decarbonize that, you know, the, you start to look at all the models, spot, spot models around the world of what it looks like to get to, you know, zero grams of carbon per uh, megawatt hour. And, you know, the, there's not a lot of options. And I think actually Carrie uh, just said uh, um, this week that, you know, we're going to get 50% of the way there. And then we realize that we're going to need new technologies to get there 50. And if those new technologies pay cost at the level this cost, um, it will it will be a, a good deal. Yeah, no, we're, we're getting the, the first 52% is the, the easy half. Yeah. Getting steel and glass and aluminum and concrete and all those big plants converted. Yeah, there's, oh yeah, yeah. The second half. You look at the IPCC models and like, you, you know, there, there's their start. Um, so we, we're very clear eyed on like, the scale of the challenge and you're gonna to have to be economic to be there. You know, the, for us, the first step is, you know, have really good um, understanding what the unit economics are, have a way to validate those by actually building things. You know, this is a cartoon here, but, you know, we are, we are building this machine um, now. We have the site and it is being cleared and it, the foundations are going in. And Do you have pictures of that? It's, it's not... Uh, yeah, so this is the render. Here's here's just the other day with them um, clearing the site. This is what the site will look like when it's done. It's 47, 47 acres. Um, this is I mentioned. No, the, it's not. 
the facility mm -hmm. to manufacture the magnets. This is that facility, and this is the actual. Oh, sorry, I'm not sharing screen. Ah. Um, there you go. Yeah, so you know th this is the the machine here um, that is the Spark, which you know we've designed and you know are placing long lead time procurements for, um, and it's you know based on Togemax that we've built before. Uh, it's got the magnets on it that are the same. You can see the Ds, the same um, magnets that we're just turning on right now. And, you know, this machine, uh, will, you know, the, the actual assembly of this machine will happen sometime in 2023, turn on in 2025. And this tells us pretty much what the costs are gonna be. Um, and the, uh, this machine will actually be housed um, on a, uh, a site here in uh, outside Boston. So here's a render of the machine. Here's what that, that campus looks like. This is the, the factory to make magnets and this is the spark machine itself. And, and we actually started clearing that site just uh, last week um, to, to put down the foundations for this machine. Um, so it's, we'll know what the economics look like. We'll know what the science looks like. We'll know what the economics look like. We'll know what the manufacturing looks like at, at a, you know, the right scale at the um, right parameter range for power plants. We'll know that in 2025. And then, then you need to raise a zillion dollars to scale, right? Well, you need to raise quite a bit, but you know, it's not outside the realm of, of what people have raised for, for other technologies that I would argue are, are potentially as impactful. Um, so, uh, you know, Put it in the scale here. You know, we're trying to do something at one fiftieth the the cost of eater, somewhere around that that range. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, are, what what have I? We have a few questions we can look at, but I I would like to go back to you and and say, you know, we've we've had a, a wonderful wide ranging conversation, but what what did I not ask? What do you want to <laughs> tell people that that would get? I mean, my, my reaction is. Why haven't we heard more about this? The when when you hear Jennifer or Biden or anybody talk about all of the above, they're talking about all of the above technologies, but they're never mentioning fusion. It's not, you know, you don't have the name recognition Elon Musk does. Um, so how do we fix that? <laughs> no, no, I think you know there's there's elements here of. You know, a like uh, put a put a uh, chart up. You know, you can do like a anyone can sit down and do the math on what it's going to take to do the energy conversion. Like you're talking about replacing fossil fuels. Like whatever you do is at the scale of fossil fuels. Like you're not just going to change that scale by an order of magnitude. You're at the scale of of many percents of GDP. You are building entire new industries. Not only do you have to replace those, you have to scale energy use to a bunch of other things that people don't have today. And so when you, I think when you when you sit down, and you actually look at the the scale of this problem um, and the scale of the resulting opportunity that basically the world has to do this. And you know, you know, people in the streets saying we have to do something, and this is what it is. You have to replace all this. Um, like we can get sort of a bit, you know, short-sighted and be like, well, that means we just have to do what we have today just over and over and over and over again. It's like, well, but what if there's, you know, the equivalent of a Rickover out there who, who, you know, does nuclear power, which was the fastest thing, you know, still the largest source of, of um, uh, carbon-free, one of the largest sources of carbon-free electricity in the world uh, in many nations. Like, what if we miss something like that? And so I think, you know, we can get an either or we can say it's all the above. When you really get an either either or category, or go, you know, when we say, look, you know, in the future we want this technology to be there. It's not saying, don't do the stuff that makes sense today. Definitely do that, but also recognize that like we need to, to accelerate across the whole chain of, of innovation because the problem is so big. Um, and uh, for fusion, you know. What can people do today? It's like, well, you know, I don't think it would make sense to to crash hundreds of billions of dollars into fusion today. There's, you know, we haven't proven enough yet in that's this field. We need to get a little bit further. 
Um, and so, you know, we were trying to be a bit, a bit measured um, rather than, you know, saying we're going to be there tomorrow and, you know, money is the only problem and, and things like that. You've got the, you got the challenge and I'm sure there's a lot of people listening who'd like to join the team and help. Um, let me, the, um, so what, I mean, give us parting words. How do you, you've got five or 10 minutes to, to give the, the lecture on, on how do we get there? Yeah. You know, I think it's a, um, so hey, I think, you know, this is the right audience, right? So, you know, MIT is, uh, is certainly a place that means a lot to me and means a lot, I'm sure to a lot of people on this call. And it's because of the, you know, idea that like the technology can be a, a part of the solution and it can be a really, really big lever to move the world. And, uh, you know, this background, uh, we, we like this background because, you know, A, you know, it's got a, a couple of, of things. One, uh, it's a lot of lights. All those lights are powered by electricity. All those lights are powered by energy that was invented. And like the most of those lights did not, none, those lights did not exist a hundred years ago, right? And a lot of those lights didn't exist 50 years ago. B, there's still a lot of places that don't have lights that have people. And like, we're, we got to figure out what to do about that because we can't just say, well, you're not going to get lights. That's not very fair. That's not equitable. So, you know, you can't shy away from the fact that we have to find a way to reconcile our need to be humanitarians, our need to be environmental stewards, right? We have, and our, like, we have to reconcile that. And in energy, that's where it's gonna, that's where it's gonna butt heads. It's like, that's already where it is. Um, and the way into that was technology. And I, I believe the way out of it is technology. And it's technologies like like fusion. It's technologies like long duration storage. It's technologies um, like advanced nuclear nuclear power plants. You know, those you have to have those. You have to have other stuff too. It's not I'm not saying it's the only thing you have to have. You have to have policy. You have to have um, uh, you know buy in and acceptance. But you do have to have those technologies. Otherwise, you're not going to solve this problem. Um, well, I mean, you're basically saying I mean, we have to go. Everything that needs to be electrified. Yep. You gotta. You have to either. Where are the, where are the other you hard? You gotta electrify. Home? What and, what industries don't don't lend themselves to electrification? Oh yeah, yeah. You gotta you, everything you can electrify should be electrified. I mean, if you can't electrify it, then you gotta start to make um, sustainable fuels, basically carbon neutral fuels, um, like aviation. You know, electric airplanes are are would be great, but you know they they are not gonna replace intercontinental travel in our lifetime, it does not look like. Um, uh, so you have to have a, a solution to make that zero carbon. Um, you have to have uh, solutions to do steel, like steel is pretty hard to electrify. It's pretty big energy use. You have to have solutions to make the products that go into agriculture. You have to have solutions that make concrete um, zero carbon. Um, you have to have uh, all, you know, how do you recycle stuff? It's not, you know, it's right now we have a climate crisis, but there's just a couple other crises brewing right behind it that deal with how do you handle the other big material flows in the world that aren't carbon? Um, and, you know, it takes a lot of energy to, to, to handle that. Um, so what would you do if you had a, a source of energy that didn't have the downside? Um, and then, you know, there's other things too. It's like, you know, more and more IPCC stuff is saying you got to find ways to, to take, maybe take carbon out of the air or you got to find ways to make fresh water where there wasn't fresh water there before or the fresh water that was there is no longer there fresh water um, is fungible with energy right yeah uh so that, you know the, the sides of these problems is is really really big um and i think we can you know if you look at the problem too small you, you forget like how big it is and and for us, you know, and our, our investors and others like look, you know, the world is going to have to do these things. Um, so let's get on with it. Let's build scalable businesses that are science based and uh, tackling really hard problems. Let's, let's go back. I mean, if, if um, I guess, after you demonstrate the next um, milestone later this summer, you're going to raise another round of money. Um, 
you want to give this group the the elevator pitch? <laughs> yeah, so it's you know we're we're sort of already already there in a lot of ways, but you know it's we've uh, developed this new technology and of uh, the magnet. It's the thing that people said was the the piece that we needed to show. Uh, we published you know the science basis. Anyone can look at what we're planning to build from our fusion machine uh, or you know, open open the world on that. Uh, we've got a place to build it. We're starting to build it. And it's the last money in before we show that it's net energy um, on earth where you show up and you push a button and a uh, fusion machine uh, makes more power than it takes to run. And you let your finger off the button and it stops. And you push the button and it goes again. Um, and uh, once you have that, uh, you know, I think that there's a whole lot of, the world sees the technology very differently um, than it does right now. And the next round of money is on the order of? It's gonna be big, it'll be a big round. You know, we're, we're not shy about how big, we, when we raise money, we usually raise pretty big rounds. Um, uh, so, you know, it'll be hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay. Well, that's super exciting. Um, Bob, you have been a, uh, a wonderful, a wonderful speaker, and, uh, and I think a great representative for your company and a great um, change agent for the whole climate problem. I I really hope you can get um, your message, which is far grander than just the physics of your problem. Um, it's you know how do you turn this into commercialization engine for a real solution. I hope you can get that. We can all help you get that word out. Uh, oh, thank you. It's been a, it's been great to be here, and you know, it's a very like what we we sort of did a quintessential MIT thing, which was we looked out and we said there's no fusion industry, so we made one, <laughs> and, um, and that's been exciting. And so we'll we'll see where it goes, and you know, we're we're optimistic, but it's got to be uh, you know, we've proof's going to be in the pudding. So the summer will be fun to watch, and then it'll be fun to build the next machine. There'll be pitfalls along the way. We all wish you enormous success. And I'm gonna turn this back over to Doug, who's got some wrap up comments from the MIT club. Bob, thank you again. Well, yeah, thank both of you, Mark, you and Bob together. <clears throat> this is just a really fantastic event. Um, I love the way you were able to interact all the way through it from beginning to end. Um, your slides, Bob, were really informative. You know, and as a MIT alum myself, I, you know, I can remember we have this catchphrase of change the world. And, you know, I really do want to echo what Mark said is that I really do believe what you may be doing right now is a world changing thing and in a huge way. And uh, I think most of us who have been following this for some time really, really do hope that it works out and, and you're ultimately extremely successful in all of this. So thank you, both of you. Um, it's just been a really wonderful event. And um, I, I just hope the audience feels the same way. And I believe they do because almost all of them stayed on for the entire time. Um, now let's talk about the last event of our season. Um, it's really gonna be an interesting one in the theme of continuing to look at climate change. Drawdown uh, is an organization that is really the epitome of uh, 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 being change in the climate, how, how we can do these things today. And Jamie Alexander, who is the founding director of Drawdown Labs, who works with primarily with corporations to help them figure out how to reduce their carbon footprint, is going to be speaking with us on Thursday, June 17th, um, at the same time as this event. And we're really looking forward to hearing from Jamie uh, and, and that being literally our, our capstone event for the season, uh, it'll be number nine. So I'm excited. I hope to see many of you who are on this call today uh, at that one as well. And to all of you, have a really great evening and thank you for joining us today. <laughs>